upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings as eagles. They shall run and not get weary. And they shall walk and not faint. Sometimes all we can do in life is wait. But I want you to know today as Deacon Smith sung that the greatest thing is to wait on the salvation of the Lord. For if we wait on him, eyes will be dry, hearts will be mended, and trouble indeed will not last always. There's a word from the Lord today in the New Testament book of Philippians. Philippians, the third chapter, verses 12 through 14. Philippians 3, 12 through 14. Once you found it, won't you stand for the reading of God's word, wherever you may be at this time? Philippians 3, 12 through 14. And as is our custom, won't you repeat after me today? This is the word of God. It has liberating and transforming power. I will praise God for this preaching moment and I declare that after this moment that I shall never ever be the same. God be praised. In Philippians 3, 12 through 14 today, in the King James Version, these words are faithfully recorded. Not as though I had already attained. Either were already perfect. But I follow after. If that I may apprehend that. For which also I apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. But this one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word, and the edification of our hearts and our souls. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of God. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I press toward the mark of the goal of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I want to talk today, my father's children, from the subject, the press. Simply put, the press. I press toward the mark of the goal of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. The press. Let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Dear God, we thank you for another day that thou has allowed us to stand here and proclaim your truths. We thank you, God, allowing those that have assembled for your hearing to have one more occasion to come to worship you in spirit and in truth. 
Now, God, we empty ourselves of our wants and our expectations. And we ask, God, that you fill our cup with the desires of your heart. That we may be made whole and made anew. That we may be liberated and transformed by the renewing of our mind. This indeed is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The press. The press. In today's text, Paul is drawing us into an understanding of ever present tension in our faith walk. He illustrates this ever-present tension in our faith walk by describing our walk, or his walk, as pressing toward the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. It is this pressing through tension that, my dears, is inescapable in our quest to be more like him. There's a misnomer in the Christian community that to know God is to live a life of no tension, life of no trouble. And because many of us live misguided focuses on faith, we oftentimes think that when there's tension in our lives that God has yet abandoned us. But the fact of the matter is that life will be full of tension. And any kind of tension that you face in life will cause you to press your way. There will not always be easy days. And there not, will not always be cool nights. And because of that, we must press our way. Paul suggests that in order to be successful in pressing through the tensions of life, we must be able to move forward despite those tensions. We must be able not to look back at the things of the past that have happened. And I believe I'm talking to somebody here that you've gone through some stuff. You've gone through some stuff more recently than years ago. And if you've gone through something, you can't keep looking back at what happened last week. You can't keep looking back at what happened last month. You've got to press your way. And many of us can't deal with tension because when tension in life meets us at our doorstep, we don't press our way. We stay in the place of tension. And I'm declaring today that you've got to move out of the place of tension. You've got to move out of the place of frustration. You've got to move forward. And you've got to leave that thing that's back there, back there, and press your way. You've got to move forward. You've got to leave those things behind. You got to leave those mistakes behind. You got to leave that stuff that you thought would never happen to you, you that stuff you thought you would never see. You got to leave it behind in order to press forward. And you can't let your past put you in bondage. And many of us allow our past to keep us in bondage. Not only through negative experiences, but through positive experiences. See, when you understand that you are pressing toward the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, then you understand also that God is not through with you yet. Paul gives us a series of things. He says, I have not apprehended it yet. I've written letters. I've been shipwrecked for the cause of Christ. I've been stoned for the cause of Christ. I've been beaten for the cause of Christ. But I still have not apprehended it yet. And I want you to know today that you haven't sang enough songs yet. 
You haven't prayed enough prayers yet. I haven't preached enough sermons yet. You haven't sat in the pews long enough yet. There's still work for us to do. And just because we've lived in some moments of success, we've got to still press our way because God is not through with us yet. But it's seemingly immature gaze at success causes the one to reach a pinnacle of some measured level of success and all of a sudden stop pressing their way. Have you stopped pressing your way today because you feel that you have arrived? Have you stopped pressing your way because you feel you've done all the church that you can do? Have you stopped pressing your way because you, don't, you believe that the best thing that ever happened to you was 10 years ago, but Paul is letting us know you got to press toward the mark of the high calling. The best is yet to come. Philippians is full of imagery. One example of which we read for your hearing today. And this imagery encourages us to press our way through life's challenges. In fact, scholars suggest that the imagery used in Philippians is directly related to athletic prowess. Now, that the writer of Philippians used is his athletic imagery uh, to sort of exemplify our faith walk. It is done four times in the book of Philippians. In Philippians 1.30, Paul talks about the struggle in the community. And in Philippians 1.30 in the King James Version, the word that was interpreted was conflict. And in more contemporary versions, the word used is struggle. But this interpretation, no matter what the English interpretation would be, in 1.30 we find that this word that was later used to cause com be called conflict or struggle, this word in the Greek represents athletic competition. It represents, it would have been a word used in that time to represent how the opponents would fight one another. So in the midst, and in 130, Paul is talking about some kind of level of physical attribute that would have rang true to his audience to make them understand the gravity of the struggle of a faith walk. Not only does he do it there, it's done a second time in Philippians. It's done in Philippians 2, 16. Where Paul says, I did not run in vain, nor labor in vain. Again, another athletic analogy given by Paul to describe what we call today the press. And oh, how can we forget one of the most infamous passages in Philippians, Philippians 4.3. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Another athletic analogy that gives the assertion that we, as athletic soldiers of the cross, have a Christ that strengthens us, that helps us to run this very race. And finally this morning, we have one more athletic analogy. As Paul gives the symbolism as this Christian walk Pressing toward the goal. Pressing toward, if you will, the gold medal. Pressing toward, if you will, the world championship trophy. He's given us an athletic analogy cloaked in the struggle and cloaked in this need to press our way to win this victory. To move from a status of victim to victor. And we must, as much as an athlete does, press our way toward the goal of the high call in Christ Jesus. This pressing the press is a continual plight of those who work out. Those that may not be athletes, but those that try to get their health in order would not be estranged to this thing called pressing. Whereas their continual plight 
every day to continue to stress themselves and stress their bodies and go to lengths that they ordinarily would not go to maintain their health. Not only is this approach to the press, as Paul indicates, applicable to the athlete or applicable to those that want to work out, but it is also applicable to those of us that seek to desire to maintain spiritual health. This pressing, same sort of mechanisms are required as we all today, from me to the pews, to your living rooms, your kitchens, and your bedrooms. Desire to have spiritual health in times like these. The best way and I can describe the nature of this press. It's through what has become one of my favorite pastimes. It's something that I do, some of you already know this, three, four, five, six, seven times a week. I've witnessed the nature of this press through my passion for bike rides. There are a few spiritual nuggets that as I ride my 12 miles three to four days a week, have a little talk with God, there are spiritual nuggets that come about through my preparation for what now is my favorite pastime. And those things I want to share with you just for a little while today. Uh, the tenets of the press. Uh, that an athlete must have in order to successfully reach either their health goal or their reward type of goal. In fact, it's interesting that we mentioned bike riding today. For those of you that follow sports, know that on ABC right now is the second stage of the Tour de France. Well, world-class athletes are coming from everywhere, and they're riding through France, but there's a mode of preparation that they've got to take in order to reach their goal. And I stop by here, my father's children, to tell you today that there's a mode of preparation that we must take in order to achieve our very goals. Several years ago, I because I had a friend, dear friend, who was a bike rider. My friend was engaging in his health. And I began to see, because he was bike riding, I began to see him losing weight. He began to tell me how he was getting a good doctor's report. And I looked at him, ladies, don't you think that, that you're the only one? Men do it too. I looked at him and I looked at my belly and I said, maybe I need to do something a little bit different. So I asked him one day, I asked my dear friend, how have you lost that weight? You're looking so good and you're buying new shoes. And he said, Andrew, I just started bike riding. And so what I did when I heard that he went bike riding, when I heard that he went bike riding, I ran out and went to Walmart. And I went to the bike rack and I bought me a bike. And I bought that bike and I made sure I thought it was the nicest looking bike on the rack. And it was for the right price, too. It was only $100. And so I got the bike and started on my journey to bike ride. But before I could start riding, there were some things that I had to get straight first. See, in order for me to go bike riding and achieve the look that my friend had so sexually achieved. I had to go find some new attire. I had to put on some clothes that were suitable for bike riding. I had to put on something that allows me to stretch 
before I get going. I have to put on something that when I sweat it, it allow the sweat to move, not make me ring wet, but allow it to sort of internally move so I can become a better athlete. And so when you experience the press, you got to make sure that you got on the proper attire. And I declare today that I could not be a successful bike rider. I could not be a successful bike rider if I was wearing this suit. And see, many of us can experience the press because we spend so much time in our church clothes uh, that we never take our church clothes off so we can fight the devil and press our way. We'd rather be cloaked up in church cliches. We, we'd rather be cloaked up in our Sunday hymns. But every now and then, come Monday, you got to take off your church clothes. You got to take off your church clothes not to be evil, not to be mean, but you got to put on something that's flexible. You got to put on something that requires you to fight. It's in the book. You got to put on the whole armor of God. And too many of us walk around and struggle with our church clothes on. Church clothes won't save you. I don't care how sharp it is. I, I don't care how detailed the pinstripes are. We, we, can't, we, we want to press, but we don't want to look like the press. You got to look like the press. You got to look like you're coming to get something out of what's happening in your life. The press. So then I made sure I had the right clothes. And y'all know how I am. I, I had to coordinate. I had to make sure everything coordinated. And so I put on the right clothes. Once I had the right clothes, and when, once I went to Walmart and got the right bike, and once, once I went out a few times on my own, and once I thought I was where I should be, once I thought that, I called my friend up and I said, I'm ready to ride on the lakefront with you now. I had been timing myself and, and thought I was making sure that I would not be embarrassed when I got out on Lakeshore Drive. I spent about a month before I called him and said, and so when I felt like my muscles were working, I said, I'm ready. I'll meet you on 67th Street. And so he and I went out to 67th Street. We went out there and I hauled my bike, my Walmart bike. I hauled it out of my SUV. He drove his out. And we got on there together and we started to ride. I got on my bike and I started to ride. I was feeling good because I had been working out for several weeks and I'm riding and I'm riding and I'm riding and I'm pressing my way. I'm pressing my way. All of a sudden, by the time we got to the first two blocks or so, by the time we got to the first two blocks or so, I'm, I'm looking and I think I'm doing good and I'm pedaling as fast as I can and I'm, I'm doing what I have been practicing all the time. And then I look up and my friend is about a hundred feet ahead of me and I don't understand it. I don't understand it. I'm pedaling like I've been pedaling. I'm, I'm moving like I've been moving. I got on the proper attire. I went and bought me a bike. How is my friend older than me? If far a hundred feet ahead of me, I've been working on this thing for a month. I don't understand. Not only was he passing me, I kept on pedaling and I kept on pedaling. I kept looking and people kept going by me. I kept seeing people three, four hundred pounds passing me. What's going on? I thought I, I thought I was doing something. And, and then all of a sudden I stopped. My friend waited for me some hundred feet upside. He said, he said, Andrew, let me see something real quick. Let me, let me see what, why, you, why is everybody passing you? And then he stopped and he looked at my bike. He said, where did you get this bike? I said, I got this bike from Walmart. It was on sale for $99. He said, you can't ride no bike like this. You bought a cheap bike. And because you got a cheap bike, you'll never keep up with me. You'll never keep up with these people. This bike is too heavy. This bike is not designed to move the way we've been moving out here. And that's why and we're moving like this. And you moving like this. You're doing that because you got the wrong equipment. I stopped by here to tell you today, some of y'all got the wrong equipment. Some of y'all pedaling, and you thinking pedaling, you thinking sweating, you thinking that's good stuff, that's bad stuff. You pedaling because you got the wrong equipment. That's why you tired. You got the wrong equipment. You're saying, Pastor, what's the right equipment? What's the right equipment? See, this is what we do. We, we oftentimes, this, what is, this is what I was doing, maybe not you. See, I was imitating. 
I went to Walmart and picked up some cheap stuff because I was imitating. That's what we do as a church. That's what we do as an individual. You're looking over at the church across the street and saying, Woo, child, they sure doing good. And you on your bike, you just pedaling. You just pedaling. You just pedaling. You looking at somebody else's marriage. Woo, they got it going. You just pedaling. And you wondering why they getting ahead of you? Because you can't imitate. You got to have the right equipment. I know that's heavy. You, you, you got to have the right equipment. You can't just ride. You got to have a, what's the right equipment? You got to have the word of God. You can't want to grow and be a church and be a mega church imitating. You got to be, you got to, you got to want to grow on the very word of God. And then you got to be comfortable with if your time don't come, it's all right because God's going to bless us anyhow. But see, so much of our life is, is messed up and in, into, into want to look like somebody else right but we don't put in the preparation we don't make the investment we don't make the investment into the thing that we need to move the agenda of God forward we got to invest in the Bible we got to invest in the Word of God I don't care how many musicians I put up there I don't care how pretty this church looks if we are not invested in the Word of God if we are not invested in the Word of God we wasting money we wasting time. And so many, and not, not only in church life, in our individual lives. If we want to be able to ride with the big dogs, we got to invest in the word of God. We got to invest in the story of God. So I began, I got the proper equipment. I went out and I bought the baddest bike I could find. My bike got a speedometer on it. My bike has an odometer on it. I went Aaron, I got me the fancy water bottle. I got me some gloves. I had the right outfit on because you got to put on the whole armor. You got to put on the armor if you're going to fight the press. Y'all with me? You got to take them church clothes off. And maybe, maybe not. And then when you take them off, the whole armor ought to be under. Some of us just put on church clothes, but we don't put on our drawers first. Uh, your underwear is the whole armor. You got to put that on first. So when you take it off, you can fight the wiles of the devil. So I did everything. I now, now I got my outfit on. I'm looking good. I got my towel. I got my towel. I'm riding. I'm looking slick. Because part of riding on the lake is you got to look good, right? So I got my towel on. I'm riding. I'm riding. Now I'm keeping up with everybody. I'm moving on. I'm getting better at what I used to do because I had the proper equipment. I got the proper attire. And I'm invested in reaching the goal. And so I got a goal to reach. So I start riding. I'm riding now. I got everything that I need. I'm riding. Oh, I'm riding. I'm on the lake. Ain't nobody passing me. I'm looking back now. I'm trying to ride with no hands. I'm looking and saying, what's going on? I'm, I'm, I'm ahead of everybody. I'm riding. I'm riding. I'm getting better and better every week. But this is what happens when you learn to ride better. And the faster you get, the wind starts to come. And so as I start riding pretty well, as I start meeting goals and expectations, I'd be riding and all of a sudden a gust of wind would come. And all I'm doing like this, all of a sudden I find myself, I'm pushing, I'm pushing. I can't make it because of the wind. The wind is too much. My odometer goes down from 10 to 4 because the wind keeps on pushing. And I don't like to ride in the wind. In fact, the wind is cold when I'm hot. But I got to press my way and so even though I got better the wind started having an impact on me and but I, what I had to learn in the wind you got to learn how to shift when the wind is coming and you're riding like this and all of a sudden the wind comes have you ever been like that in life have you ever been like that in life you were riding fast but then the wind come trouble come stuff happen with your kids stuff happens on your job stuff happens at the church the wind will come and when the wind comes you start driving slow but you can make it through the wind once you learn how to shift so I learned how to shift. I learned how to shift from, from the 10 speed down to the 6 speed. And so you're saying, Pastor, how does shifting on the bike represent shifting in the spiritual realm? Well, you got to learn how to shift. When you're walking through life and the wind blows, when you're walking through life and unexpected disappointment happens, you got tears in your eyes, you're worried about the future, you got to learn how to shift. How do you shift? You go from standing 
to pray. And that's how you shift. You shift yourself. And you say, Lord, I need you every hour. I need Father. I stretch my hands to thee. No other help that I know. If I withdraw thyself from me, oh, whether shall I go? So then you keep on riding. You keep on riding. But there's another way to fight the wind that I like a little bit better. See, I don't shift too well. I pray well. I'm not saying I don't pray well. Don't y'all get it mixed up. But I don't shift well. And so what I learned to do, I learned when I ride my 12-mile journey, I ride the same 12-mile route every day. So when I get on my bike and I make that first few turns, I start to feel the wind. So, oh, okay. Today, the wind is coming from the south side. And it's coming from the south side to the north side. So when I make my way back around to the north side, what I'm going to do is I'm going to build up some steam because I know that the north side is coming. And if I build up some steam, I'm going to come around with the corner of the speed to, de to defeat the wind. In other words, I'm going to discern when the wind is coming. I'm going to allow the Holy Ghost to discern when the wind of life is coming my way. And I'm not going to shift I'm not going to change. I'm going to keep on riding because I already know that the wind is there. I already know that trouble's going to come. So even though the wind is pushing me, I'm saying, that's all right. This storm going to pass. That's all right. The other side of South Holland is coming around. That's going to give me the ability to ride through the wind. Press your way, my friends, through the wind. Ask God for the ability to discern when the wind is coming. But you can only do that with the proper equipment. The word of God. Well, when you learn to master the wind, and when you learn to ride just a little bit faster, when you learn to do that, your speed begins to pick up. And when your speed begins to pick up, watch this, it becomes more dangerous for you when you ride. Because the faster you get, if you fall, you could get hurt even more. So as my speed picked up, I realized that I wasn't fully protected. I began to talk to other friends at work that also bike road. And they began to tell me the dangers of riding not fully protected. You see, I had on proper attire. My attire matched. But what I didn't do that every bike rider should do, I never got myself a helmet. Because see, the faster I ride, the more danger I have of falling off my bike and splitting my head. And my head is the central station by which all of the activity of my limbs takes place. So I could fall and not scar up my arm. But if I hit my head, then I could lose all of my faculties. I could become paralyzed. I could, could forget who I am. So then I didn't go to Walmart, y'all. I went to a bike shop. And I put on a helmet. Because when you are fighting against the devil, and when you are riding fast, he's ready to knock you off of your bike so he can split your head. In other words, so you can lose your mind. And so you got to put on the last part of the whole armor of God. You got to put on the helmet of salvation. And so now I can ride like I want to ride. Go through the wind like I want to go through. And if I fall off, my head is protected. And if my head is protected, if I fall, when I get up, I'll be all right. If I fall, I'll remember my destination. If I fall, I'll know I'm going to make it home. And so we got to press our way. The enemy doesn't want you to make it. The enemy does not want you to succeed. 
But you got to press your way. You got to press your way. You got to take off your church attire. Take off phony cliches of the church and songs and whatnot. You can use them on Sunday, but on Monday you got to put on something. You got to take this off and put on the whole armor of God. And then after you do that, you got to put on, you got to invest in something that's going to allow you to run the race. Nothing other than the very word of God. And you got to get up on there and ride. The next thing you got to understand is when you ride, the wind will come. The wind will try to push you back, but the wind won't win. The only thing you got to do is shift. And if you shift, you'll make it through the wind. And if you don't want to shift, all you got to do is watch that thing long enough. You'll be able to see what direction it's coming from. I thank God for the Holy Ghost. I can stand here in the church sometime. And I can tell I got a devil over there. I can tell I got a devil over there. And now he's taught me to specialize. And saying, good morning, how are you? The wind. The wind. Then after you get your speed up. You got to protect your mind because the devil will try to attack your mind. He'll try to attack your mind through your family. He'll try to have you forget who you are and whose you are. But you got to keep on riding. You got to keep on pressing. You got to keep on moving. And you got to stay on. And the last thing I want you to know today, the last thing I want you to know, you got to stay on the bike. You got to stay on the bike. You got to keep on pressing toward the goal. Stay on the bike. I've done all this talking to you, but I'm going to tell you, in a few days, I'm going to get back on the bike. And I'm going to get back on the bike, and I'm going to be riding. But it's going to be a day that I didn't feel like getting on the bike. Maybe I had some soul food before I got on the bike. Maybe I had some ice cream before I got on the bike. And it's weighing me down, and I done said, I ain't going to ride no 12 miles today. I ain't going to get, nope, nope, I ain't going to make it. I can't make it today. The wind is going too hard. Is there anybody here living in life? You riding the bike of life. You saying, I can't make it. It's getting too hard. I just can't make it today. But while I'm riding, something on the inside gets a hold of the outside. It says, don't forget why you're riding the bike. Don't forget why you're riding the bike, Andrew. You're riding the bike so you can be better. You're riding the bike so you can achieve your weight goal. You're riding the bike. Don't give up. But I like what the Spirit says to me. Just when I want to get up. If you made the ride yesterday. If you made the ride last month. If you made the ride the other day. You'll make the ride again. Just keep on riding. You'll make it. Because I press. You'll make it. Keep on riding. Keep on pressing. Don't give up. For God, the best is yet to come. Can I get a witness today? Can somebody say hallelujah today? I'm going to keep on riding. I'm going to keep pressing on the upward way. I'm going to keep reaching my goal because he's been good. Keep riding. Keep riding. Don't give up. Don't give up. Keep riding. He's called you to a special place. Keep pressing. The press is not easy. But when I'm riding, every time I get on that bike, I make sure, watch this, I make it home. That's my main goal. When I'm counting the distance, I go around the neighborhood one time, I go around the neighborhood two times, and just when my muscles lock up, I'm reminded I'm over halfway there. And if I keep on pedaling, I'll make it home. I'm giving you the blessed assurance today that you're more than halfway there. All you got to do is make it home. Not to your physical address, but one day the pleasures of this world will be over. And it will be God's to call and ours to answer. 
our brief speck in time on this side of a little while will be over. And so we ride the road of life so that one day we will meet the goal.